Germany will become totally dependent on Russian energy if it does not immediately change course. Мною принято решение о проведении специальной военной операции. Europe's worst nightmare is coming true. Winter is around the corner and their biggest gas pipeline has been shut. Energy prices are headed to catastrophic levels, say you. Economists are now projecting a winter recession for Germany. Namaste and welcome to ISSF Samvad, a platform where we discuss and deliberate on topics related to international relations and geopolitics. Today we have a rather very special guest guest with us, Miss Karen Kanaisel. She is a multi-talented and multi-faceted personality. She has served as a career diplomat, and she had a career in academic journalism. She has published multiple books, and she is also a renowned expert on energy diplomacy and Middle East politics. She is, and uh, this impresses me a lot. Is also a polyglot, but I have been told that she does not speak a word of Hindi. So, madam, I think if there is a scope, you can take up Hindi as well. Uh, however, madam's uh, uh, madam's career highlight was when she served as the Minister of External Affairs in Councillor Kutz's government. Madam, what an honor and a privilege it is for us to welcome you on ISSF Sambad. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Namaste, Director Mr. Singh. Thank you. And good Thank morning you. to all your colleagues and to the audience. Thank you so much, ma'am. Ma'am, I'll start by uh, asking a rather a very serious question. Uh, 2017, ma'am, uh, you were invited by uh, uh, Councillor Kutz to join his cabinet as the External Affairs Minister. You are, ma'am, spearheading Austria's foreign policy, waltzing through the global uh, diplomatic arena. Uh, fast forward five years. now you are forced to leave the uh, place you called home for 50 years and settle thousands of kilometer away could you uh, tell briefly our viewers what happened hmm. well um when uh, the government uh, had to resign uh, due to a no confidence vote by a parliament in may 2019 I said to myself, "Well, sorry for the fights, for the work that I had started, but life continues, and I wanted to uh, simply continue the books that I had in my computer. There were two half-finished manuscripts, and take up teaching, as I had been doing for 22 years. I had established my own little company of of analytical work, and that was my desire to simply continue what I had been doing before my ministership." but i realized unfortunately very soon that i didn't get one single contract and um, so uh, the the fact was that i had no income as of autumn 2019 and uh, furthermore there was a very nasty media campaign uh, calling me um, well i don't want to 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 use the nasty words but it was a, a very destructive morally and financially destructive media campaign inter alia due to the fact that i had not uh, given the the tips that uh, the certain people were expecting from me i call it corruption but there's a very unfortunate practice uh, in terms of politicians handing out uh, to publishing houses tremendous amounts of money in austria i didn't do that and uh, the vengeance was heavy so um in summer 2020 I against my will I decided to quit Austria and uh, you don't give up everything that you have built up in your life um uh, just like that it uh, you don't go abroad uh, at the age of 55 because you think somewhere else it's 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 more interesting no I was really forced out of my country and I was looking for a new life in France and I realized that in France when I finally had found a house Uh, after having lived in 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 different renting Airbnb uh, situations, 
that I uh, could not open a bank account because apparently my name had been blacklisted and I had never known about that. <laughs> so I, I must say it's a very unfortunate situation that lists have replaced laws inside the European Union. That's how I had to experience. And let me add on that, this was before uh, Russia's invasion into Ukraine. So uh, it has nothing to do with sanctioning, with people speaking not or speaking about the war, but it was a very unfortunate situation. So in the end, I uh, was once again forced uh, to quit <laughs> for a second time. And that time, the European Union, if you want, for good as an EU citizen. And I decided to move to Lebanon from where I'm talking to you now. Uh, and uh, Everything is difficult in Lebanon. People are emigrating like 10, 15,000 every month. I decided to come. I speak Arabic. I know the country a bit. I have friends from childhood days here. And you know, there's one very, very important aspect. There is freedom of mind. And uh, this I cherish a lot. <laughs> right, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, actually, we got a taste of what you're going through after we sent out the promotional posters for our uh, virtual discussion. Because after we sent out the posters on Twitter and our, on, on our uh, various social media channels, we started getting uh, threats and requests to cancel this interview uh, from vested interests. So, uh, but that actually solidified our resolve to have you on our show and to get your voice across. So uh, thank you uh, for that. And ma'am, uh, moving on, I'll ask a question from one of our viewers. Uh, he asked, uh, uh, Madam, what is your idea of Europe and how different today's Europe is from your idea? Thank you very much, first of all, for having invited me and for having um, confirmed that, uh, despite all the nasty attacks. Um, Europe, you know, it's difficult to define, first of all, in a geographic way, but also in a cultural way. Uh, we know very well where the Americas are. We know very well where the huge continent of Africa is. But where is Europe in a geographic sense? Um, when you look at it in, uh, from a historical point of view of philosophical ideas, uh, it's often connected with uh, the Roman Empire. So Europe above all, when you take it from the Roman uh, philosophical uh, approach, is all about the Mediterranean. So in that context... Uh, North Africa, Eastern Mediterranean, Lebanon, where I'm right now, is uh, an inherent part of European civilization because everything started in the Mediterranean. It was uh, this big pond, this big lake <laughs> uh, that connected East and West and that brought all the accomplishments of Oriental civilization um, into um Italy, Greece, what we call today Italy and Greece. So um, that would be one approach to Europe. And then, of course, when um, when we superficially speak in today's um, context about Europe, we converge it all the time with the European Union. Now, the European Union consisting of 27 member states is one thing, but... Um, uh, Serbia is just as much part of Europe, even though it's not a member of the European Union. Or uh, what about the United Kingdom, which stepped out of the European Union? Uh, is it part of a European uh, educational heritage? Is it not? Of course it is. Uh, it's not part anymore of uh, this institutionalized Europe. So um, as uh, your um um, guest uh, has asked, um, there are libraries uh, to answer that is that question, what is Europe and how does it differ? How does it differ, I would say, above all, Europe today is not anymore this pole of attraction, it's not anymore that center of power that it was for about 500 years. Uh, and uh, the it, it, it was a center of power, not only due to the fact that uh, um, the European ships were sailing the world, and we have to bear in mind, really tiny countries did that. I mean, Portugal is a tiny country. Uh, England as such is very small. Uh, but uh, thanks to the um, seafare and, and, and trade and conquests through language, uh, through the administration, I mean, whom do I tell? I'm speaking to, to a continent that uh, went through all that. Uh, 
But uh, these times are gone and they are gone not only in terms of trade and commerce and power projection, but they are also gone in terms of demography. And um, I always say there are two factors which you cannot change. It's demography and geography. You can change a political system, you can change an economic uh, uh, way of running a country within an afternoon, but you cannot change geography and demography. And on both levels, um, Europe is today in a quagmire. Demography, we can speak about that maybe later, um, but geography, uh, to come back also to the question, to the definition of Europe, uh, Europe is part of the larger Asian continent. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's very difficult to say where it ends. Is, uh, is Russia part of Europe? Is Turkey part of Europe? Um, the Middle East, in the UN definition, it's Southwest Asia. <laughs> and there is the, uh, the bridge, the continental bridge via Turkey into uh, uh, via the Black Sea, which is... Uh, not really also the open sea, uh, into, into Central Europe. So we are interconnected definitely very, very profoundly by the Eurasian landmass. Right, ma'am. Ma'am, we'll shift our focus to the decline of rule of law in Europe, which unfortunately you are a victim of. So can you shed some light on this uh, matter? That how come uh, Europe, which, uh, which gave so many freedom ideals, uh, descended into this uh, thing? Yeah, thank you very much for that very important question because it's it's very, very close to my heart. And I had, as somebody who had studied law, who has been teaching uh, international law for two decades, I had never ever expected that there would be such a decline as we are witnessing right now. Um, if we want to say when it when did it somehow start, we could say it was uh, in the aftermath of the terrorist attacks of 9-11, when a lot of, of uh, changes were happening in the penal procedure law, uh, in, uh, in penal law as such. Let me take a fundamental concept, innocent until guilt proven. Uh, this is uh, part of the Habeas Corpus Act of 13th century, uh, it's it's the it's the hard core of um, uh, of, uh, uh, of 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 what built uh, the, the the rule of law throughout centuries, uh, starting from from the uh, Habeas Corpus Act, uh, Magna Carta, to to all the constitutions, and uh, we saw in the very first year of the twenty first century that uh, things were put upside down. Uh, and uh, there, uh, to, to, to illustrate it very clearly, uh, uh, WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange is is, is illustrating uh, that example. Um, so um, th 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 that would be one one very sad uh, uh, example. Uh, and apart from that, uh, we have seen also via the recent sanctions. Uh, uh, against Russian citizens, people who had nothing to do or who have nothing to do with the Russian government have seen their bank accounts frozen. Um, there, there were several uh, elements which make me doubt to what extent do we really still apply uh, the very essence of what we have achieved in terms of equality of citizens before the, uh, in front of the law. Right, ma'am. Uh, Ma'am, we'll shift our focus to the Russian-Ukraine war, which is uh, happening right now. Uh, I'll quote two persons. First, I'll quote Professor Mir Scheimer. Uh, he had said that NATO is responsible for instigating Ukraine to play hardball with Russia, whereas Russia wanted to uh, sit down with Ukraine and solve the matter. And uh, the second person I'll quote uh, will be you, who during uh, her uh, uh, time as the external affairs minister had said that we need to see Russia as a partner, not as an enemy. So uh, do you think that this uh, war in Ukraine could have been prevented if, uh, if uh, NATO wouldn't have uh, instigated Ukraine to play hardball with Russia? Yes, I think that the war could have been prevented if there had been something like 
real diplomacy. What happened at the beginning of this year, this shuttle diplomacy, many heads of government, uh, presidents traveling to Moscow. Uh, we all remember the, the, the photos of the long table, of the distance. Uh, but that was just symbolic. Uh, it was not real diplomacy. There was no trust building. And I think that trust has has gone. Trust has been destroyed and it has gone not only at the beginning of the year and with the invasion of Russia into Ukraine. The trust has been destroyed over the last 15, 18 years um, on, on, on many files, uh, whether it was uh, with regard to uh, Western invasions in the Middle East, starting in 2001, 2003, uh, the, the handling of uh, what happened in, in the, in the so-called Arab Spring movement in 2011. And uh, we have seen a stalemate of diplomacy, which I described in my book, which I published in 2020. And I say there are all craft of diplomacy has gone. Before we speak about the art of dialogue, we need craftsmen of diplomacy, craftsmen of international relations. And that has to do a lot with putting yourself into the shoes of the other for a moment, uh, knowing the history, knowing the, the, the burden of history. And um, there is no black and white in that very important file. Uh, the Ukraine-Russian um, question is uh, is old and it has been shaping relations uh, between Russians and Ukrainians for centuries. Uh, and when the war, just before the war started, I said, I, I, I hope it wouldn't. I, I didn't expect it to happen. And I said it would be more cruel than what we have seen in Yugoslavia in terms of a, of a real brother war, of a real uh, fratricidal war, because uh, there are mixed marriages, because there are mixed regions, uh, because uh, people do not opt often for I am this or I am that, because they are I am both. I am in due to to to, to intermarriage and so on. Uh, so uh, I'm confident that this war could have been avoided uh, if there had been something like genuine diplomacy, taking into account uh, the many many layers of that question. Right, ma'am. Um, we'll shift our focus to energy diplomacy because, as you say, energy is the name of the game. Uh, Ma'am, our first question is related to the sanctions on Russia. Uh, uh, before uh, Russia was to go uh, in Ukraine, uh, the NATO led by the US, they said that we will put so many sanctions that the Russian economy will come to dust. Uh, today, ma'am, almost six months has passed. Russian economy is doing better than ever. The ruble is the best performing currency. Their current account deficit is uh, doing well. And their uh, oil and gas companies, they have uh, posted record profits. So what went wrong in the West strat strategy with regards to the sanctions in Russia? It might sound now very banal and I myself, I still can't believe it that it happened that way. But both decision shapers, the people who prepare the files for the so-called decision takers, those sitting in the European, in the councils of European uh, ministers of foreign affairs, uh, energy, etc., they simply misunderstood the notion of supply and demand. Uh, when you uh, when you cut down on supply, uh, the prices go up, and this has been happening. Uh, we are living in an interconnected world, and uh, even so, a uh, lot of experts, uh, as you just uh, described, were claiming that the Russian economy is not so stable and it could be easily destroyed, it could be put into Middle Ages, etc. That has not been the case for the simple reason that um, oil and gas and coal prices and of all the other commodities, uh, which Russia also supplies to the global market, have gone up. And this is market force. <laughs> This is supply and demand. <laughs> and uh, uh, it, it really makes you wonder how people who dispose of uh, well-trained stuff uh, simply disregard uh, market forces such as su supply and demand. And um, uh, the fact that the electricity market is going through the roof these days has nothing, but really nothing to do with uh, the, the fact that uh, there might be less gas flowing from Russia to uh, to the European Union. It's 
due to a liberalized electricity market that we, the European Union, started about 25 years ago, uh, which was from the very beginning a blurring also of market forces by trying to create elements to, to the advantage of renewables. Uh, the idea might have been good, but uh, the application over the decades also created for a different uh, type of environment uh, yielded results that, uh, that are very harmful right now and that um, destroy uh, purchase power of the people, of millions of people who are not anymore able to pay their bills. And of course, it also creates social unrest. Uh, so um, I think that there has been a complete, but really a complete disregard for market forces. Right, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, we'll shift our focus to the gas and electric electricity crisis in Europe. Because if you'll see people uh, on the streets, uh, they are claiming that uh, earlier we used to get 2000 euros, 3000 euros annual electricity and gas bill. And now they are paying 10 times, even 20 times that amount. Yeah. So uh, how do you see this uh, crisis worsening for Europe? And how uh, do you think Europe should deal with this? <laughs> I think uh, on a very practical level, most probably we will see nationalization of utilities and energy companies. It already started last year in the United Kingdom. Um, we have seen EDF, Electricité de France, which is the biggest um, electricity supplier in France, which was nationalized a few months ago. Uh, it's a little bit like when we remember 2008-9 in the aftermath of the financial crisis, the breakdown of big banks in the US. Um, big companies uh, like General Motors were nationalized into government, as they called them then in the US, instead of General Motors, government motors. Uh, we had banks with insurance companies nationalized for a certain period. And I believe that there will be now a wave of nationalization of energy companies, uh, because otherwise uh, it will be very, very difficult to, to, to run through all that. Uh, now, nationalization is um, somehow, I would say, at odds uh, with the entire approach that we have had on a global level and in particular inside the European Union when it comes to liberalization of the energy market, of the electricity market. And uh, it was not a fully-fledged liberalization. It was blurred, as in the case of the electricity market, to the advantage of so-called green uh, power, but which blurred the market. And and, and we, we, we see right now how it, how it causes uh, deep, deep problems. So uh, whether nationalization will solve it, I have no idea, but that I believe will be one first element uh, of, of, of the immediate future, what we will see will happen. And I also don't see uh, the EU27 act here together. Uh, when it comes to um, obtaining uh, import contracts for oil, gas, coal, whatever, uh, everybody does uh, his own, uh, minds his own business. Uh, the Italians travel to Algeria, the French travel a few months later, they come too late. Uh, everybody is traveling to the to the Gulf countries, uh, trying to get contracts uh, from Qatar, just as if the these contracts were available, available from, from one quarter to the other. No, they are not. Uh, so um, this, uh, th this will also lead to a further fragmentation of the European Union and the united approach that they claim has been here in the first month uh, will not continue because it, the reality is that everybody is looking for how can he satisfy his own domestic energy consumption. Uh, so that that will be will have an, a tremendous impact on, on the European Union. And thirdly, I would say there will be a further deindustrialization, which anyway has already been happening. I mean, we, we have had it ever since uh, the 1980s outsourcing. It started with the textile and metal industry, um, profiting from a low labor cost, profiting from uh, less restrictions uh, uh, whether it was in, 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 in your part of the world or then maybe the Indian labor costs went up, so you move further east. Uh, it's uh, the, 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 
these things have been going on now for uh, at least 40 years and Europe has already been deindustrialized. What remains is uh, an automotive industry, a petrochemical industry that currently is now also suffering a lot. And uh, that uh, that will have a tremendous impact on uh, uh, level uh, level of uh, standard of living. And uh, to what extent uh, a powerhouse like Germany can remain that powerhouse and can have the leverage on the rest of the European Union as it had in the past. Right, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, I'll ask you uh, a question related to the Middle East politics. After uh, the United States led NATO, it uh, announced sanctions against Russia. UAE, uh, the United Arab Emirates, it refused uh, to vote in favor of it and it abstained. Uh, Mohammed bin Salman uh, led Saudi Arabia. They actually uh, went ahead one step and they called uh, President Putin and discussed the en energy market with, uh, related to the OPEC plus platform. So do you think this is a sign of defiance because both UAE and Saudi Arabia, they have been historically a major allies of uh, NATO and the US. So according to you, is this a sign of, def uh, of defiance in the Middle East? It's a very interesting development that is happening uh, that started actually in December 2016. I was there at that OPEC Ministerial Council and I remember very well how some commentators uh, were um, well, um, um, making uh, ridiculous comments and say, oh, that will never work. And uh, uh, F Russian Federation and Saudi Arabia, they have been at odds uh, for, for decades and they have been competing in the oil market. Yes, true. But interestingly enough, we have had this OPEC plus uh, um, um, compromise going on now for five years and it works quite well. And as you have correctly pointed out, very traditional allies of the US, of NATO, such as uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, uh, are looking elsewhere and are taking a more um, sovereign approach uh, of their decisions um, with whom they do business under which circumstances. When we look back into the 1960s still, it's not too long ago, uh, Aramco, before it became Saudi Aramco, the, the, the national oil company, the biggest oil company in the world, uh, was, uh, was the center of U.S. policy making in the entire uh, Arab Gulf countries. So uh, that was their gate into decision making right into the royal palace of, of Riyadh. Uh, and uh, 50 years later, this is not anymore the situation. There have been changes. Uh, also, we can say already in the in the last four or five years, if we remember that uh, President Trump's first uh, visit abroad was to Saudi Arabia, uh, and that was quite a surprise. Uh, and uh, he made very strong declarations and commitments to Saudi Arabia. So also within these four years, uh, the situation between Washington and Riyadh uh, keeps changing. Uh, and the watershed line will be the currency basket in which oil will be traded uh, in the, in the midterm. That has been a topic of debate, to my knowledge, at least for 18 years. Uh, and it is now coming back to the agenda uh, because um, there's more and more talk about the end of the hegemony of the US dollar. Even the Financial Times published an article a few days ago on that. So it's it's not anymore kind of secretive um, debate among uh, some some insiders who are highly critical of the US dollar. No, it's it's uh, it's it's now a common debate, and uh, uh, the dollar is still in charge of about 42% of global trade. Uh, so that cannot be replaced that quickly. It's cash in many countries, like, like here in Lebanon, everything is US dollar cash. Uh, but um, things are changing and a lot will depend on how um, the BRICS as such can maybe uh, establish their own multilateral financial institutions, their credit cards as an alternative. Uh, so um, uh, geopolitical tides, changes, 
over the last five, six hundred years, ever since we have been keeping track of them via via archives and 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 currencies, uh, they always go along also with uh, what happens to the dominating currency, and uh, this is this is changing. So within OPEC plus, uh, there is. Um, it's a microcosm, if you want, of the most strategic, most global commodity, which is oil. Uh, and uh, this is interesting to watch because it affects all of us. Right, ma'am. Ma'am, I'll ask my final questions and this will take us back to Germany. Uh, ma'am, do you think Germany is regretting some of the decision it made in the past few years? Because... Uh, president Trump, uh, when he was the president of the United States, he uh, spoke from the podium of the United uh, Nations General Assembly and he said that Germany is going to be on a sticky situation if it continued its dependence on Russian oil. And we and there is a famous video where German diplomats are giggling at, uh, at his uh, speech. And uh, uh, do you think that it is also regretting uh, uh, throwing away its nuclear uh, reactors because uh, across the border, uh, if you'll see France, it generates 70% of its energy from nuclear uh, reactors. And it is in a much more comfortable position uh, now, uh, if you'll see. So uh, what, according to you, uh, should be Germany's plan going ahead? And, and is Germany uh, regretting its uh, decision? Very interesting question. I think, Germany, there's a huge divide within uh, uh, maybe not so much German political class, but between people in the industry and the political class on the other hand, and among the population as such. Uh, it's definitely a divide that you can say it's 50-50. Uh, and uh, let me explain that why uh, <laughs> some uh, mentality in Germany that has always been there Um if I may say so, as somebody who speaks German, but is not German, but who lived and worked in Germany for a while and, and has been studying German history by passion, uh, the Germans tend to embrace apocalyptic uh, ideas, you know. It's very different from the Anglo-Saxon mind in terms of looking for opportunities. Uh, let's do business on this and that. Let's grasp this opportunity. This is the Anglo-Saxon mind in terms of let's do business and let's uh, let's make money with that. The German mind, the Germanic mind, uh, uh, and you don't have to read the unreadable Schopenhauer and Nietzsche and all that very heavy German philosophy, but that encapsulates it, it very well. Uh, there's lighter literature, but there has always been a kind of embracing the apocalypse somehow you know there's a there's a very gloomy approach the cup is not half full the cup is half empty and uh, this uh, differs in germany very much already when you go you mentioned france and in terms of uh, uh, of energy this is very interesting to watch um uh, the uh, the belief the trust that french have in technical progress uh, let's say, uh, nuclear energy, nuclear fission, nuclear fusion, whatever. And on the other hand, you have in Germany a deep distrust, uh, um, a growing distrust when it comes to uh, to uh, techno technical progress, uh, which is amazing. Even so, uh, Germany has been in, in, uh, in, in the vanguard of, of, of major innovation. But... Uh, let let me give the, share with the audience a figure I always like to quote. Uh, out, nine out of 10 stock listed DAX companies, at least that was the figure I read 12 years ago, were established prior to World War I. So we are still uh, taking advantage of uh, the innovation of progress that was invented by German engineers, be it Siemens, be it Bosch, be it Diesel, between mid 19th century and World War One, uh, and uh, ever since, uh, well, certain things were innovated. I don't want to to have disregard for that, but not to the extent that happened before. And uh, there's also a mindset in Germany that I've been uh, observing, especially when it comes to to uh, to building grids, to 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 the electricity market, etc. 
there's a conviction among many people that you can be completely autonomous, that you can be autark, that you can live, so to say, on your little farm behind your fence with your sheep, knit your pullovers uh, and, and leave the nasty world outside. No, this is not possible. It was never possible. Uh, we, we have always been living somehow interconnected because none of us can produce all the things that we need for daily survival. We are not Robinson Crusoe's. Uh, sitting on, on, on a little island, and also that was fiction. Uh, but this is something that is uh, very strong in the, in the German mindset, and today, once again. So the rift is deep, and uh, um, I think there is a huge part of the German industry, uh, the small, medium-sized companies, which are the backbone. It's We don't have... So many huge companies like in France or, or Spain or Italy, where you have some huge companies that, that are in charge of the GDP. No, it's these medium-sized family companies that are struggling and that are wondering, but what is the government doing? Why did we have to move out of this and that? Why do we have to give up all sorts of energy supply? Why do we have to add another sanction against this and that country? And maybe next target might be China. So uh, th these people are wondering, they are unhappy, uh, some of them angry, some even desperate, and this is the worst situation. But on a, on a level of political class, I see a lot of confusion and absence of courage to really say, well, uh, we should maybe take a step back and, 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 uh, and rethink the one or the other declaration. So... Um, um regret uh is maybe something that is uh takes courage and uh and uh it it means uh, will you win your next elections how will people how, how can you face uh your own uh followers in, in in terms of a political party but um uh the destiny of germany what will happen to to the to the german economy as such to, to to how households will be able to deal with the current situation that is definitely decisive for for the rest of the european union right ma'am ma'am on that note we'll wrap up our discussion and it was uh, so kind of you to give us your valuable time and i do not uh, know how 40 minutes went uh, it was so 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 insightful and uh, danke schön thank you so much ma'am Thank you so much Namaste. for your time. Namaste, ma'am. Thank you so much. <laughs> so much. And I wish you a very a good week. And I'm looking forward, maybe one day will come that we can meet uh, in, person. Uh, in an analog way. But uh, I'm very grateful to technology to allow us this kind of meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Have a nice day, ma'am. Thank you so much. All the, all the very best to you, sir. Thank you. Sir.